Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. This is Biology 205 at Illinois Central College. Today we are studying Chapter 15, Sensory Pathways and the Somatic Nervous System in Anatomy and Physiology 1. The learning outcomes for today's lecture include the following. To differentiate between general and special senses. To explain the difference between somatic versus visceral senses. Explain the difference between sensation and perception, and know what part of the brain decides perception. To describe the difference between the functions of free nerve endings and sensory receptors. To define a receptive field and explain how to do the two-point discrimination test. Explain what a labeled line is and how false sensations can occur. Explain the difference between a tonic and phasic sensory receptor. And define accommodation and adaptation and what are fast and slow adapting receptors. Also to explain what the following sensory receptors monitor and where they're located in the body. This includes mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors, photoreceptors, and thermoreceptors. And then we'll discuss the difference in density of cold versus hot sensing receptors. We're gonna cover this in lab. Also, the difference in perception and how it's dependent on the initial temperature of the receptor. Now, we're going to cover this in the lab as well, but you're probably aware that this makes sense because you'll notice a temperature change much more easily when there's a big difference in the temperature. Also, nociceptors. So you'll explain what substance P is and endorphins and how they affect perception. We'll also explain the different tactile receptors and explain what they sense. This includes tactile discs, root hair plexi, tactile corpuscles, bulbous corpuscles, and lamellated corpuscles. We'll also explain the location for first, second, and third order neurons in the sensory pathways. Explain the function of the following somatic sensory tracts, and that is to determine if the signal travels via a dorsal, ventral, or lateral column, and if it's a dorsal posterior column or medial lumniscal. And we'll also look at the anterior spinothalamic pathway, lateral spinothalamic pathway, phantom limb pain, referred pain, and the spinocerebellar pathway. Last, we'll explain why we are unaware of many visceral sensory pathways and describe the significance of the volume of space that's taken up by different body parts when we're looking at a homunculus of the primary somatic sensory cortex and the primary motor cortex. We'll explain what decussation is and where it occurs, and we'll explain the location of the upper and lower motor neurons in somatic motor pathways. We'll explain the function of the following somatic motor tracts, the cortical bulbar, the lateral and anterior cortical spinal tracts, the medial pathway, and not all three pathway tracts are required, and the lateral pathway. We'll define the role of the basal nuclei in the cerebellum and what that plays in coordination as well as in skeletal muscle contractions. And then we're going to integrate all of the nervous system chapters. So this is where everything keeps building upon itself and we'll explain the anatomy and the functions of the nervous system to process an event and respond to it. So for example, if you step on something sharp, you'll be able to integrate all of this information to explain the reflex arc that takes you off of the sharp object so you don't just stand there on something sharp. You'll explain the pathway involved with your saying, ouch. You'll explain the pathway to know to lift your leg and turn your ankle to see the bottom of your foot and also to explain the pathway to see and then recognize that you stepped on a nail. Let's start off with a pop quiz of some of the things we've covered in the previous chapters that will apply as we move forward covering the content here, which is going to integrate what we've learned so far. Which cranial nerve in this group carries only sensory impulses? Vestibule cochlear, facial, trigeminal, or vagus? To answer this question, you could either try to remember all of the cranial nerves and all of their functions, or you could take advantage of the mental heuristics that I showed you in the previous lecture, which indicate the mnemonics OOO to touch and feel very good velvet AH, which gives you the first letter of each of the cranial nerves. So I've sketched that out on the left, and adjacent to it, I've included the mental heuristic of the mnemonic, some say marry money, but my brother says bigger brains matter more. So that heuristic lined up with the first one to show you the number of the cranial nerves will help you to figure out which function is assigned to which cranial nerve. So if you go down the list and we're trying to find which ones are only sensory, you can see that there are only three. The first two O's, which are not listed here, and then also one of the V's. So you have to be able to know the difference here between which is the vestibule cochlear and which is the vagus. 
Well, we know the vagus is cranial nerve 10, so then by default, the answer is going to have to be A, vestibular cochlear, which would make sense because there's a receiving sensor information coming from the vestibule regarding our proprioception and the cochlear nerve, and that's going to give us hearing. Which cranial nerve innervates the organs of the abdominal, pelvic, and thoracic cavities? A, the abducens, B, the glossopharyngeal, C, the trigeminal, or D, the vagus? Well, right away, we know that the abducens is responsible for motor movement of part of the eye, so we can rule that out. The glossopharyngeal, we can just take a look at the name. Glosso is tongue and pharyngeal is throat, so that wouldn't make sense. The trigeminal nerve, we recall from those images before, showing you the three different branches, hence tri, of the trigeminal nerve, and those were in the face. So then by default, the answer is D, the vagus, which is our wandering nerve, which innervates many things in our abdominal, pelvic, and thoracic cavities, including notably our diaphragm. So the answer is D, vagus. Which area of the brain is responsible for processing and interpreting visual images? A, the frontal lobe, B, the parietal lobe, C, the temporal lobe, or D, the occipital lobe? Well, the frontal lobe is going to include our primary motor cortex and premotor cortex, so it's not the frontal lobe. The parietal lobe will include our primary somatosensory cortex and the somatosensory association cortex, so we can rule that out as well. The temporal lobe will include the auditory association area and the auditory cortex, which makes sense because it's right by our ears. And then lastly, the occipital lobe at the back of our head. The posterior aspect will include the visual association area and the visual cortex. So this is the area that will take visual images like the letters of a word and allow you to recognize them and understand that L-O-B-E spells lobe. So the answer is D, occipital lobe. Today's lecture is broken down into the five segments that mirror what's happening in your textbook. First, we'll start with an introduction and discuss in general the sensory pathways and the somatic nervous system. Following this, we'll move into a discussion of the sensory and motor pathways in general. Then we're going to discuss sensory receptors. Then we'll move into general sensory receptors. And then we'll discuss the afferent division, which is sensory. So we'll be discussing the somatic and visceral sensory pathways. And then lastly, we move into the efferent division and discuss somatic motor pathways. In chapter 15, we're going to be discussing the sensory pathways and the somatic nervous system. So what this means is we're going to be discussing the pathways of sensation specifically for the general senses only. So we're excluding the special senses like vision and hearing and taste and smell. All of those are excluded because they'll be covered later. So today we're gonna to cover the general senses. And when I say general senses, I mean things like feeling pain and temperature and pressure. In other words, things you can generally sense with your skin, okay? So the same thing is going to apply when we discuss the motor pathways. So we're discussing how we make the body move. We're only discussing the somatic nervous system, which is controlling contractions of our skeletal muscles. So we're gonna discuss the autonomic nervous system at another point, but for now, we are focusing specifically on sensation of our general senses and then general movement of our body via skeletal muscles. Let's discuss first section 15-1, in which we'll talk about the broad overview about how sensory stimuli create signals that are sent along our sensory pathways, and then we respond with motor commands that are sent along motor pathways. So starting in order, if we're going to sense something and become aware of it, a couple things need to happen. First, we have to have some mechanism to actually sense something happening, and then we have to have a pathway to send those action potentials up to our brain for processing. So the sensory receptors are the specialized cells or just processes on cells that are going to be able to continually monitor conditions that are specific to the type of receptor that they are. So we're going to discuss a number of these different types of sensory receptors coming up in subsequent slides. But for now, it's important to know that sensory receptors will monitor both our internal and external environment. So those are called internoceptors and exteroceptors. So when these sensory receptors are stimulated, they're going to be able to generate action potentials. And that action potential is going to be sent along the sensory pathway up to the brain or spinal cord for processing. 
you probably recall the acronym SAME, meaning sensory, afferent, and motor is efferent, right? So the afferent division of the nervous system is our sensory division. So when we're sensing things with our general senses, we are sensing either somatic or visceral sensation. Somatic referring to our musculoskeletal system and our movement of our limbs and where we are in space and time, whereas our visceral sensory pathways are going to be sensing things from our viscera or our organs. The efferent division is going to be our motor division. And so today we're discussing the somatic motor portion, which is just moving our body. This is not discussing how we have movement of our gastrointestinal system, creating peristalsis, for example. That's not part of the somatic motor portion here. So the efferent division is going to be taking those somatic motor commands and controlling peripheral effectors like our biceps so we can pick up a cup of coffee. The commands for the efferent division are going to travel from the motor center in the brain and they'll follow along on somatic motor pathways, which by the way is the exact opposite of in the afferent division, we have our somatic and visceral sensory pathways. Figure 15 hyphen one in your text shows you an overview of how the sensory and motor pathways work together. So starting at the top left, you see an arriving stimulus and that stimulus will cause depolarization of the sensory receptor. So that creates a graded change in the membrane potential, which allows an action potential to be generated. But only specifically if we have enough of a graded change to reach threshold to actually trigger an action potential. So the action potential will develop in the initial segment of the axon and then is propagated. So axons of the sensory neurons are going to take this information, whether it be about touch or pressure or temperature or a chemical, whatever it is, it's going to take that information as an action potential and send it to the central nervous system. So once it arrives at the central nervous system, that information can be processed and there are going to be relay stations and sensor information can be distributed out to multiple different nuclei so that way different areas can process the information. So that will include centers that are both in the spinal cord and the brain. So once this information is processed, we have to do something about it, right? So let's say we stepped on a nail or something hot. We have two different options for response, either a voluntary motor pathway or an involuntary motor pathway. So the involuntary motor pathway is going to include processing that occurs typically in the spinal cord or the brainstem. And so that gives us things like immediate reflexes. So that way we can respond immediately before we're even aware of what it is that we've been exposed to or whatever the stimulus is. And the reason for that is because the sensations haven't reached the cerebral cortex at the time at which we've actually sent the motor pathway and voluntary information to get our foot off of the nail. Now the voluntary response is going to be a little bit later. It's not totally immediate. And this can either moderate or in some way support whatever the involuntary reflexive response was. So the interesting thing here is that in the voluntary motor pathway, our perception only allows us to take awareness of about 1% of all of these arriving sensations that are coming to our primary somatosensory cortex. Now we'll discuss section 15-2 and how our sensory receptors will help connect our bodies with our internal and external environments through the nervous system. Sensory receptors are either processes of specialized sensory neurons or cells that are monitored by sensory neurons. And these are gonna provide information to our central nervous system about either our internal or our external environment. So the information that arrives at our central nervous system is called a sensation. But once we become consciously aware of it, now we will call it a perception. Our general senses are broadly distributed throughout our body. And what the general senses do is allow us to monitor our sensitivity to things like temperature, pain, touch, pressure, whether it's light pressure, deep pressure, vibration, and proprioception, which is really just our body position in space and time. I gave the example in a previous lecture about how certain athletes like LeBron James, for example, has fantastic proprioception. When you can bounce a basketball in between your legs without even looking at it, that is knowing exactly where you are in space and time. For those of us who may not be so specifically athletic, you can think about if you ever ride a roller coaster, if you close your eyes, you know that you're upside down. All of those different sensations that you have that indicate your body position is your proprioception. 
The special senses are different from our general senses because our special senses are located only in specific sense organs that are designated specifically for that one purpose. So for example, your sense of olfaction is also known as your sense of smell. That only occurs in your nose. You can't smell with any other part of your body, so it makes your olfactory sense a special sense. The same thing applies to our gustation, which is taste, vision, our equilibrium, and hearing. These are all special senses that have their own specific organs, such as the eye or the ear, and they are all protected by surrounding tissues. In order for us to detect the specific stimulus, we have to have a receptor in that area that is being stimulated that is able to respond and to recognize that specific stimulus. So we call this receptor specificity. So each receptor is going to have a very specific thing that it will continue to monitor. And each of these single receptor cells will also have an area that they monitor. So they have like their own territory. So the receptive field is going to be that territory that the single receptor cell monitors for a specific characteristic of stimulus. Now the larger your receptive field is, the more difficult it is to be able to determine the location of the stimulus. So in the lab, what you'll be doing is having a friend put a mark of pen on your arm while your eyes are closed so you can't see exactly where that is. And then you with your eyes closed are going to try to take a different color pen and to match that exact same spot on your arm. What you're going to find is that it's very, very difficult to do that in certain parts of your body because we have larger receptive fields, so we have a general idea of the area in which something happened, but we can't pinpoint it. There are other parts in our bodies where we have receptive fields that are very small. So in that case, it's very easy to identify exactly on your fingertip, for example, where a certain stimulus was. But on the back of your arm, it might be much more difficult, and this is because of the size of the receptive fields of these specific receptors. Transduction is going to be the process by which a sensory receptor will detect the arriving stimulus and then convert it into an action potential. So if an action potential is not generated, then you will have absolutely no response whatsoever because that graded potential that doesn't trigger an action potential because it doesn't reach the threshold for that exact triggering, then in that case, you will not have any awareness whatsoever at any part of your brain, conscious or unconscious, that any sensation has occurred. Figure 15-2 in your text shows you how receptors have their own specific receptive fields. So you can see that there are two specific receptors that are showing free nerve endings right underneath the surface of the epithelium. So what they're doing is able to sense an area. The one on the left is in purple and the one on the right, the receptive field number two, is in blue. And so you can see that they have their own specific areas. Those are totally different nerves monitoring different locations entirely. In the special senses of taste, hearing, equilibrium, and vision, we have specialized receptor cells that are able to sense that specific stimulus and then to be able to communicate that information with sensory neurons. And it does this via chemical synapses as opposed to electrical synapses. Sensory information is going to be interpreted in our central nervous system once it reaches cortical neurons via what is called a labeled line. So the labeled line is going to be a specific pathway by which information is going to come in about one modality or one type of stimulus. So for example, touch or pressure or vibration. And so we're going to have a number of action potentials arriving via this labeled line to give our central nervous system the information to interpret. And so the central nervous system will interpret our action potentials based on both the frequency and the pattern of the action potentials. So how many action potentials there are, how frequent they are, and the pattern of them is going to indicate things about the strength or duration or the variation of stimulus. So for example, a light touch may yield fewer action potentials, whereas a very deep, prolonged touch may produce multiple, faster action potentials, and that provides that information to our central nervous system for processing to understand if it's a light or a deep touch. So our perception of the nature of a stimulus is going to depend on the path that it takes in the central nervous system to be processed. 
Adaptation is our ability to reduce our sensitivity to a constant stimulus. And so there are two different ways in which that can happen. One is peripheral and the other is central. So peripheral adaptation is when our peripheral nervous system is going to decrease the level of receptor activity. So it will become less sensitive to whatever that stimulus happens to be because the stimulus is going on indefinitely. Whereas the central adaptation, which occurs in the central nervous system, is going to involve the nuclei along a certain sensory pathway being inhibited. So central adaptation is your central nervous system reducing the sensitivity in your brain to be able to respond to a certain stimulus that's arriving at the brain. Whereas the peripheral adaptation is reducing the sensation that would be even sent to the brain for processing in the first place. So our nervous system has this function so that way it can quickly adapt to all sorts of constant stimuli which are painless. So for example, vacuuming that might be going on in the background while I'm talking, you may not even realize it until I mention it right now. <laughs> That's the sort of thing that we just phase out through adaptation. These receptors can be either considered tonic receptors or phasic receptors. So tonic receptors are going to be receptors that are always active. So they are constantly monitoring whatever stimulus it is that they have specificity for. So the action potentials are going to be generated at a specific pattern that's going to reflect the level of stimulation in tonic receptors. So tonic receptors are slow adapting receptors, meaning that they really don't have very much peripheral adaptation at all. And so, for example, pain receptors are slow adapting receptors. So by this mechanism, if we have some pain in a specific part of our body, it can remind us of the injury that we had for this long after the actual initial damage has even occurred. Figure 13a in your text shows you what a tonic receptor looks like. So you can see each of those red lines that are vertical is indicating an action potential. And if you look at the top line, you'll see that normal is a flat baseline and the yellow is an elevated stimulus area that is increased. That correlates specifically with the area below it, showing that there are much more frequent action potentials during the time of increased stimulus. So as long as the stimulus is increased, tonic receptors are going to keep responding over and over and over and over again, firing action potential after action potential after action potential, over and over and over. Now keep this in mind as we contrast this with phasic receptors. Basic receptors are going to be receptors that are normally inactive. So they're just hanging out doing nothing. So they don't sense things until there is a change of a stimulus. So for this reason, we call these fast adapting receptors because they're gonna notice change very quickly. And so they'll respond to that strongly at first, but then they just kind of give up and figure, okay, well, I'm cool with it, whatever. And then they only respond again when there's another change. So let's look at an image that shows what this means a little bit better in the next slide. Figure 15-3B is showing you phasic receptors. So you can see here right away, this is very different from what we just looked at with the tonic receptors. So in this case, the top line of the stimulus is the same. We start off with a normal baseline, and then there's that area in yellow where we have increased stimulus of whatever type of stimulus is occurring. And then down at the bottom, you see the frequency of action potentials, and those three lines on either side of the increased stimulus correlates to just the start and the stop of that increased stimulus. So for as long as the stimulus is at a normal baseline, there are no action potentials whatsoever. So it's only generating an action potential when there is a specific change and the rest of the time they are inactive. Now we'll discuss section 15-3, all the different types of general sensory receptors and how they're classified. At the broadest level, when we discuss our general sensory receptors, we're gonna think, what are they monitoring? They're either monitoring the outer external environment, our internal body's function, or where we are in space and time. So our position of our skeletal muscles and joints. So exteroceptors monitor the external environment, interoceptors monitor the internal environment, and proprioceptors, of course, monitor proprioception or our position in space and time. Our general sensory receptors, again, this is not our special senses like smelling or vision. So our general sensory receptors are going to break down four different types of stimulus. So we have four different types of receptors that can each sense that specific respective type of stimulus. 
Nociceptors will be able to detect pain. Thermoreceptors are going to sense temperature changes. Mechanoreceptors are going to understand any type of physical distortion. And chemoreceptors are going to respond to chemical concentrations that are either very high or very low. Nociceptors are general sensory receptors that have specificity for pain. So they do this by free nerve endings that are going to have very large receptive fields, so it's difficult to localize pain. It will be in a broad area for the most part. So these free nerve endings as nociceptors are really common in a lot of different places throughout our body. Specifically, we'll see them in the epidermis, so in the superficial portions of our skin. They're also common in joint capsules and within the periostea of bones and around the walls of blood vessels. Our nociceptors can be sensitive to a number of different things, but this includes temperature extremes. So something that's very, very cold can be very painful, whereas something that's very, very hot and burns you can also be very painful. Mechanical damage can also cause pain. So your pain receptors can be activated through a lot of pressure. For example, if you hit your thumb with a hammer or dissolved chemicals. So if you spill something toxic on yourself in a lab and it gets underneath your gloves or you have a tear in your gloves, all of those will indicate to pain receptors that a stimulus has occurred and they will send action potentials in response to this different stimulus. In previous lectures, we discussed the different types of axons, either type A, type B, or type C fibers, but only type A and type C fibers are going to carry painful sensation from nociceptors. So the myelinated type A fibers are the fastest ones, right? These are the big guys. So they carry sensations very quickly. So things like fast pain, such as prickling pain, is going to be carried through a type A fiber. When I say fast pain, what I mean by this is that the information is going to reach our central nervous system really quickly to be able to trigger a somatic reflex. So again, this is something like you touch something hot on the stove. You're very quickly going to reflexively move your hand back. In this case, the processing may occur from the central nervous system as a somatic reflex, but the information is also going to be relayed up to the primary somatosensory cortex in our brain, and therefore it will come to our conscious attention that we're aware that we are in fact pulling our hand away very quickly from something extremely hot. The type C fibers, on the other hand, are much slower. So they're going to carry sensations of slow pain. So this is pain that instead of being absolutely sharp and prickling, this is the burning, aching, slow pain that just kind of drives you crazy because it's relentless and doesn't go away. A lot of chronic pain may even be categorized as this. So these sensations are going to cause a generalized activation of our reticular formation and also in the thalamus. So you will be aware that there is pain in a specific area, but it's only in the general area. You're not aware of it exactly. It's not localized to a specific area. So the difference would be the myelinated type A fibers are sensing fast pain. For example, when you're chopping onions and you cut your hand, they'll move that hand out of the way right away and it goes up into your brain for processing to your conscious awareness. Whereas if you're just kind of irritated by your shoe, for example, that is rubbing on your heel because they're new, that would be more of a slow pain. It's just kind of irritating, rubbing your skin over and over. You're aware of it, but you're not exactly sure what specific part of your heel, but you know in general your heel is bothered. So that would be the difference between the fast pain and the slow pain. When you study pharmacology, you're going to learn about a number of different types of analgesics, which are pain relieving medications and how they work. And there's a variety of different pain relieving medications that work in a variety of ways on various locations and types of pain. So you'll learn that later. But just for now, I want to discuss very briefly with you opioids and how these work, because these are very commonly prescribed and there is a lot of risk associated with them, but they're also very effective. So first, I want to talk about how they work. So they're going to influence our release of chemicals from our brain's internal reward system. And so that emotional response is going to give us a sense of calm and relaxation. So that way we feel much happier than we did before we had the medication in our system. Opioids are also going to slow down our automatic functions like breathing and heart rate. So this can be very important, as you can imagine, that you don't want somebody to overdose on these medications because it can slow down your breathing and heart rate sufficiently to cause an overdose that would result in death. But having that breathing and heart rate reduced calms you down. 
So anybody who's ever had an asthma attack will know that you feel very stressed out and extremely anxious when you can't catch your breath. So by reducing that breathing rate and heart rate, you calm down and you feel less anxious about your pain. And then further, the third thing that opioids do is they're going to slow down the pain signals before they even get to the brain. So it's basically acting as a peripheral adaptation, right? And so that reduces our idea of our perception of pain. Side effects, though, of course, that opioids make people nauseated, tired and sleepy, and boy, can they ever make you constipated. And I don't mean constipated in the sense of, you know, oh, I can't go like on those commercials where people seem generally uncomfortable. I'm talking not defecating for a week or two weeks or longer. This can be terrible. So <laughs> this is something to really keep in mind with opioids. There's also some other side effects over time that can, of course, become a problem. People become very dependent upon them, and so you need to take more and more in order to be able to achieve the same amount of pain relief. So it's worth not taking more than what you really need to. Also, when people get used to taking it for a long period of time, when you stop taking it suddenly, you can withdraw. So typically, people titrate off of opioids, which means one day you take a little bit less, the subsequent day you take a little bit less, and you just keep going down until finally you're not taking anything. Also, people will sometimes take these for reasons that they shouldn't, which can cause a problem. And also, there is an element of addiction that can occur by taking opioids over time. This is definitely something you're going to want to look into and study more in pharmacology, but this is not testable material. I just wanted to share this with you as a clinical correlation. Thermal receptors are going to be receptors that have specificity for temperature. So this is going to be located in free nerve endings that are in the dermis of our skin, in our skeletal muscles, also in our liver and our hypothalamus. So these sensations are going to be moving along the same pathways that carry pain. And this would make sense because heat can cause pain, right? And extreme cold, which is the absence of heat, can also cause pain as well. So this information is going to be sent up to our reticular formation and the thalamus, and although to a lesser extent, to the primary somatosensory cortex. Mechanoreceptors are receptors that have specificity for mechanical stimuli, such as pressure. So they're going to be sensitive to things that distort the plasma membrane. So pushing on it, for example, will trigger an action potential if it reaches threshold. So the membranes of mechanoreceptors have mechanically gated ion channels that are going to open or close in response to any type of movement. So things like stretching or compression or twisting or any other distortion of any type is going to have the same effect. It's going to create an action potential that will then send information to the central nervous system for processing. Mechanoreceptors can be broken down into three categories. So the first is going to be tactile receptors. So tactile receptors are going to have specificity for sensations of touch, pressure, and vibration. Specifically, when I'm talking about touch, I'm talking about the shape or texture of an item. So you can specify the difference between velvet versus something that might be plastic. You can also sense pressure. So if you're getting a massage, are you getting light pressure or firm pressure? You can tell the difference through your tactile receptors, which are mechanoreceptors. And also vibration. Anything that is pulsing can be sensed through tactile receptors that are mechanoreceptors as well. Baroreceptors are going to detect pressure changes. And this is important in our blood vessels because they have to respond to our changing blood pressure, right? So baroreceptors are also present in our digestive system, our respiratory system, and our urinary tracts. So basically, any part of our body that holds a volume of fluid or of a gas is going to be able to have a baroreceptor to basically detect the stretch in the pressure. So for example, think in our bladder. We have baroreceptors in our bladder wall to determine when our bladder is very full and when we need to urinate. The same thing is true in our digestive system. We can sense in our stomach after Thanksgiving dinner that our stomachs are very full of food. So our baroreceptors are a type of mechanoreceptor sensing that pressure change. Proprioceptors, sorry, proprioceptors are also a type of mechanoreceptor, and these are just going to monitor our proprioception again, right? So that's the position of our joints and skeletal muscles in space and time. 
Next, we're going to discuss tactile receptors, because as you can imagine, the things that we touch are going to give us a ton of information. With our eyes closed, we can identify the difference between a cup of coffee or a pen or something soft or something hard. All of these different things are occurring through our tactile receptors because we're sensing things as touch. So our tactile receptors can either have fine touch and pressure receptors, and these ones are extremely sensitive because of course it's sensing fine touch. So if I touched a feather on your hand, tactile receptors with fine touch would be able to identify that. These have very small receptive fields so you can pinpoint exactly where that feather touched you. And also they'll provide detailed information about the location of and the, the type of stimulation. Now crude touch and pressure receptors are going to have larger receptive fields. So that means that if a feather touches this area, because it senses crude touch, it may not exactly sense it as well as you would hope for. So you might sense something happened, but you're not entirely sure. And you may also not exactly know where on the back of your arm that might have happened. So it really doesn't give you a whole lot of information about the stimulus or the nature of what it was that touched you if it's a crude touch or pressure receptor that is sensing that specific sensation. Of the six different types of tactile receptors that are present in the skin, the first is the most obvious. It looks kind of like a tree with a bunch of branches all sticking up. And those branches that you can see are going to be sticking up into the epidermis. So these are free nerve endings that can be triggered by a number of things such as touch or pressure. And you can see that they're located in between epidermal cells. These have tonic receptors and as a result, they have small receptive fields. So that means you can localize the sensation via a free nerve ending very easily. Root hair plexus nerve endings are very similar to the free nerve endings that we just looked at in the previous image. So in this case though, instead of having the extensions of the nerve endings going up into the epidermis in between epidermal cells, here in the root hair plexus, it's wrapping right around the root of the hair. So as a result, it's able to monitor any type of distortion or movement that happens on the body surface wherever we have hair on our body. Root hair plexuses are going to adapt rapidly, which is really important so that way we're not constantly aware of a sweater rubbing on our arm hair. So they'll first detect initial contact and anything subsequent, but you don't just sit here listening to the lecture thinking about how the sweater is rubbing on your arm hair all the time. So that adaptation is very important. Tactile discs look like the past two types. They look like free nerve endings because there's a single afferent nerve fiber. And then you can see there are several different nerve endings coming up off of the main afferent nerve fiber. But instead of those just being thread-like extensions like in the root hair plexus or in the free nerve endings, you see here at the end we have blunted broad discs, hence the name tactile discs. So they are going to sense fine touch and pressure and they're sensitive to shape and texture. So as you can imagine, look at the broad base of that tactile disc, right? It is going to be able to sense a lot of different things coming in from above, pressing down on either the far right or the far left side of the disc. So because of having that broad end, they're extremely sensitive tonic receptors and they have very small receptive fields. Next, we have the bulbous corpuscles or Ruffini corpuscles. So these bulbous corpuscles or bulbous bodies are going to, again, look similar to the free nerve endings, but instead of going up into the skin, into the epidermis branching out, or instead of wrapping around a hair base at the hair root, or instead of having flat discs on the end, in this case, it's wrapping around collagen fibers inside of a capsule. So the dendrites of this sensory nerve fiber are going to have multiple locations in which they can sense pressure and distortion of the skin. So these are gonna be found in the deep dermis in the reticular layer, and they're tonic receptors. So they're gonna show very little, if any adaptation at all. Lamellar corpuscles or piscinian corpuscles are very different in appearance than the other four types of tactile receptors that we just looked at in the previous slides. So in the previous slides, you would see that there would be a single sensory nerve fiber that would have multiple branches that would have something either at the ends or would wrap around something or extend up in something. In the lamellar corpuscle, you can see that there's only a single sensory nerve fiber and it is sticking up into the center of this area. So 
in this area, we have a number of concentric layers or layers going around in a circle, one around one another. Those are called lamella. And they're separated by collagen fibers. And in between each of those collagen fibers is layers of fluid. So what this means is you have to press through all of those layers in order to have the dendrite in the very center actually sense anything that's coming in from the exterior environment. So the example I like to give here is this is like having a stick inside of a water balloon. So if you wanted to poke from the outer aspect of the balloon to feel the stick inside the water balloon, you'd have to press pretty hard. If you press just a little tiny bit, you would distort the balloon, but you wouldn't sense the actual stick inside of it. So in this analogy, the stick is our sensory nerve fiber with the dendrite at the very end. So if you want to touch the very end of the stick, you'd have to poke in and distort all of those concentric layers, all the lamella, in order to gain access to the dendrite. So lamellar corpuscles are therefore sensitive specifically to deep pressure only. They are fast adapting receptors and they're really sensitive also to any pulsing or any type of high frequency vibration. Lastly, we have tactile corpuscles or Meissner corpuscles. So if you look at the image on the right, you can see a light micrograph image. And this is showing you a tactile corpuscle within the epidermis. So you can see how large this is. It's a very big structure. So we still have the single sensory nerve fiber coming in up to the capsule. But then within the capsule, you can see there are multiple dendrites all branching, and they're branching in all different directions. So it's very interwoven. So as a result, these are highly sensitive. And what they're going to sense is fine touch, pressure, and also low frequency vibration. These are going to adapt to stimulation very quickly. In fact, even as quickly as up to one second after contact. And I like to think of the tactile corpuscles as these are the sexy corpuscles, because these are in all of our very finely sensitive places, like our lips, fingertips, nipples, and also external genitalia. Now that we've discussed all the tactile receptors, let's discuss baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are those which monitor changes in the pressure within an organ. These general sensory receptors are going to have free nerve endings that are going to branch out within elastic tissues, and they're always present in walls of distensible organs. So a blood vessel is one example, but your bladder is another, as well as your stomach is another. When you think about baroreceptors, think about barometric pressure. So barometric pressure is something as a scuba diver you have to be aware of as you dive to deeper depths. Or if you think about the weather, you think about a barometer measuring changes in the pressure in the environment, which might indicate a cold front or a warm front is coming in. So the barrow part means pressure. So baroreceptors are going to be able to respond immediately to any change in pressure, but they do adapt pretty quickly too. Pop quiz time. Which type of receptor is required for taste and olfaction? Is it A, nociceptor, B, thermoreceptor, C, chemoreceptor, or D, mechanoreceptor? Well, we know that nociceptors are for pain, so we can rule that out. Thermoreceptors are for temperature, so, I mean, while it is something that we do detect, that's not technically taste. That is part of our experience of tasting things, but it is not actually taste. Mechanoreceptors are going to be things like pressure, so it's not that. And lastly, chemoreceptors. C is correct because it is the chemical that is on our tongue that we're able to sense for both our senses of taste and olfaction. Which type of receptor is required for feeling the movement of a single hair on your skin? A. Nociceptor, B. Thermoreceptor, C. Chemoreceptor, or D. Mechanoreceptor? Well, if we're thinking about the movement of a single hair on our skin, we can rule out nociceptors because that's not a pain sensation. And it's also not a temperature sensation, so we can rule out thermoreceptor. And there's nothing chemical happening with movement, right? So we can rule out chemical receptor. So the movement of a single hair is going to be a mechanoreceptor that's going to sense that. So the answer is D, mechanoreceptor. Figure 15-5 in your text shows you some various locations of baroreceptors that are present in your body. So one place that's very important that's little discussed is the baroreceptors of the carotid sinus and the aortic sinus. Specifically, the carotid sinus is going to have the role of determining how much blood pressure is coming up to our brain and to our respiratory control centers. We also have baroreceptors that are in our lungs, so we're able to sense 
how much we need to breathe on our next breath. Do we need to breathe in more deeply to bring in more oxygen? We also have baroreceptors in our digestive tract, so we know that if we're really full after Thanksgiving dinner, we feel that for sure. Baroreceptors of our colon are definitely going to tell us when we're feeling like needing to have a bowel movement maybe coming up at some point in the future. And once that baroreceptor reaches a certain threshold, we receive multiple baroreceptor signals from our rectum that's full, that will trigger a defecation reflex. And then lastly, we also have baroreceptors in our bladder wall, right? Which are gonna help us understand when our bladder is very full of urine and that triggers the urination reflex. Proprioception is strictly a somatic sensation. So that means that we don't have any proprioceptors in our visceral organs of our thoracic cavities or our abdominal pelvic cavities, which just means that if you were to close your eyes and think about it, you have no idea where your spleen is at this point in time, right? So there is no way you can know that. So we have proprioceptors though in our joints, our tendons and ligaments, and our muscles. And that gives our brain information about where our bodies are physically oriented in space and time. Proprioceptors can be broken down into three major groups. The first is muscle spindles, and these are gonna monitor skeletal muscle length and trigger our stretch reflexes. Golgi tendon organs are the second type of proprioceptor, and these are pretty similar in function to bulbous corpuscles, but instead they're at the junction in between skeletal muscle and its associated tendon. So it's worth keeping in mind that muscle and muscle are attached by tendon, but muscle and bone are attached by a ligament. So Golgi tendon organs are gonna monitor the tension during muscular contraction. And then last, we have receptors and joint capsules that are free nerve endings that are going to detect pressure, tension, and movement at the joint. Chemoreceptors are specialized nerve cells that are going to be able to sense specific concentrations of specific compounds or chemicals. So they'll respond to both water and lipid soluble substances that are dissolved in body fluids. These exhibit peripheral adaptation within seconds and chemoreceptors also monitor the pH, carbon dioxide and oxygen levels of arterial blood. They do this in carotid bodies as well as in aortic bodies. So the carotid, body, sorry, carotid bodies are found near the origin of internal carotid arteries and the aortic bodies are found in between the major branches of the aortic arch. Figure 15 hyphen six in your text shows you where some common chemoreceptors are in your body. So starting at the top, you can see that there are some chemoreceptors present in and near the respiratory centers of the medulla oblongata. These sense changes in the pH and the carbon dioxide levels in our cerebrospinal fluid. So as a result, this allows for adjustment to the depth and rate of respiration. We also have chemoreceptors of the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. And via cranial nerve nine and 10 respectively, these will sense changes in pH, carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood, and then send that information to the brain for integration. And that will allow for reflexive adjustments in our respiratory and cardiovascular activity to accommodate these changes. Now we'll discuss section 15-4 the afferent division or the sensory division. So we're going to discuss both the somatic and the visceral sensory pathways. At the broadest level, a sensory pathway includes a stimulus, an action potential in the first sensory neuron, and then it goes to an interneuron, and then to a third order neuron for processing in the central nervous system. Let's go a little bit more closely into detail and take a look at this. So first off, we have a sensory neuron that is going to send via an action potential sensation to the central nervous system. This is called a first order neuron because it's the very first neuron in this process. The second neuron is known as the second order neuron and this is usually an interneuron and that's gonna be present in the spinal cord or the brainstem. So we'll receive the information from the first order neuron and then this is the point at which it decusses or crosses over to the opposite side of the central nervous system. The third order neuron is of course the third neuron and this is the neuron in the thalamus and it's going to receive information that's coming in from that second order neuron or interneuron and this is what allows the sensation to reach our awareness. At a broad level, here's what the general sensory pathway looks like. So we have a receptor that senses whatever stimulus it is that it is specific to and the first order sensory neuron will send the action potential onwards. 
There will be a diverging circuit, by the way, to an inner neuron if the sensation requires a reflex. So we also have the second order neuron, which comes next. And this second order neuron is an interneuron, and this will send information from the sensory neuron to the thalamus for processing. The third order neuron is going to originate in the thalamus and send information to the postcentral gyrus. Next, we have processing that occurs in the primary and association areas of the central nervous system. The sixth step is that the premotor area will send information to the precentral gyrus. Therefore, an upper motor neuron in the precentral gyrus can synapse in the cord, send information down to the lower motor neuron from the cord out to a skeletal muscle, and then we have movement. We're going to talk more about these upper and lower motor neurons coming up. Our somatic sensory pathways are pathways that carry sensory information from our general body, not including our viscera. So that means it's carrying sensory information from our skin, our muscles, our head, neck, our limbs, our thorax, anywhere that could be our external body that is not our viscera. So there are three major somatic sensory pathways and sometimes the name gives it away. So the spinothalamic pathway is gonna take information from the spinal cord and send it to the thalamus. The spinocerebellar pathway, again, from the spinal cord to the cerebellum. And then we also have the posterior column pathway. Figure 15-7 in your text shows you the three different pathways for sensory information. So we have the posterior column pathway up at the top of the image. This is highlighted in blue. And so you can see that the posterior column pathway is going to be broken down into two specific locations. And these are on both sides, so they're symmetrical. We have the gracile fasciculus and the cuneate fasciculus. The gracile fasciculus is the graceful little delicate one that's smaller and more medial. And the cuneate fasciculus is more wedge-shaped, larger, and more lateral. The spinocerebellar pathway is highlighted in yellow, and you can see that that's broken down into two different compartments. One is posterior, and this is obviously a much larger section. And then the anterior spinocerebellar, sorry, anterior spinocerebellar tract is much smaller. It's about a third or a quarter of the size of the posterior spinocerebellar tract. Lastly, we have the spinothalamic pathway that's highlighted in green in this image. And you can see that this is broken down into two separate regions, the lateral spinothalamic tract and the anterior spinothalamic tract. And these are exactly where they're located. So you look for that anterior median fissure in the spinal cord cross section to be able to identify where you are and the one that is more anterior is the anterior spinothalamic tract, and the one that is more lateral is the lateral spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic pathway is taking information from the spinal cord and carrying it to the thalamus. This carries sensations of crude touch, pressure, pain, and temperature. So the first order neurons are going to enter the spinal cord and they synapse there within the posterior horns. So there in the posterior horns, we're going to have our interneuron, which is the second order neuron. And this is where it decusses or crosses over to the opposite side of the spinal cord before it continues to ascend in the spinal cord. So then the third order neuron is going to be located in the ventral nuclei of the thalamus. So once this is sorted and processed, then the sensation will be sent to the primary somatosensory cortex. There are divisions, like everything in anatomy, of course, in the spinothalamic pathway. So we break this down into the anterior and the lateral spinothalamic tracts. So the anterior spinothalamic tract is going to be carrying crude touch and pressure sensation, and the lateral spinothalamic tract is going to be carrying pain and temperature sensation. Figure 15-8 in your text shows you a two-page spread of the somatic sensory pathways. What we're looking at here are the spinothalamic pathways, specifically the anterior spinothalamic tract and the lateral spinothalamic tract. These run together, but there is a slight difference here. So on the left, what you're looking at here is we have in red the axon of the first order neuron entering through the posterior horn into the spinal cord, then we're going to synapse onto an interneuron, which is our second order neuron indicated in white, which then has an axon carrying information up to the thalamus, where it then is going to synapse again on the third order neuron, sending information to the appropriate prim prim primary somatosensory cortex area. 
So what we're looking at up top is called a homunculus, which is basically a schematic showing you in a weird caricature-like form what part of our cerebral cortex is responsible for sensation of what part of our body. On the right, you can see we have pain and temperature coming in again from the right side of the body, entering through the posterior aspect of the horn, coming in, it's going to synapse on the interneuron in the spinal cord, decuss over, and then ascend through the lateral spinothalamic tract, past the medulla oblongata, past the midbrain to synapse in the thalamus again on the third order neuron, which will then send information to the primary somatosensory cortex in the area that is respective to the location at which the pain and temper sensation is deriving. If the spinothalamic pathway is disturbed, whether through injury or illness, we can have disorders in the sense of how we perceive the origination of pain. So for example, in phantom limb syndrome, which is when people have an amputation for any number of reasons, whether it's having stepped on an IED while in Iraq, or whether it's because they had diabetes and had an amputation, whether it's medical or traumatic, regardless, it makes no difference. Ultimately, you can have continued sensation of pain in a limb that's absent. There's also something called referred pain, which is when you have the sensation of pain in a part of your body that is uninjured, but the pain is actually originating in another location. So the idea in referred pain is that when you have very severe pain, you have a lot of action potentials arriving very quickly, and that high level of stimulus can cause other different local neurons to fire additional action potentials. So it can give the sense to the brain that the sense of pain is larger than what it really is because it's so intense. So for example, a heart attack is oftentimes felt in the left arm, and myocardial infarctions or heart attacks are extremely painful in about 75% of cases. There are actually about 20 to 25% of cases that are clinically silent and people don't even know that they've had a myocardial infarction. But in the ones that are painful, that pain can be very intense and the pain radiates through into the left arm. We call this referred pain. Figure 59 shows you some common referred pain clinical presentations. So at the top right, you're gonna see somebody who has heart pain, and that pain, which can be very severe in a myocardial infarction, can be referred up into the neck and jaw of the ipsilateral side, and similarly to the ipsilateral arm. If there's pain in the liver and gallbladder, which can arise when somebody has a colilith or gallstone, that pain can be referred up to the ipsilateral or same side shoulder. Down at the bottom right, you see the pain in the ureters, which is caused often by a kidney stone or nephrolith that has lodged within the ureter. That can cause pain that can be wrapped around at an oblique angle around our anterior axis. And then also we can have pain in our abdomen, whether that is anywhere in our viscera, ranging from our stomach, small intestine, appendix or colon, that can expand pain to a broad area in the general vicinity. So you can see the colon is indicated in blue. So you could have a specific part of your colon have an issue, for example, a malignancy in the ascending colon on your right side. But because that could be extremely painful should it interfere with very specific nerve endings, that pain can be referred to all of the nerve receptors that would be responsible for that general area of your lower abdomen. So it's very hard to localize based on your physical idea of pain where a certain malignancy or injury or illness may be present. The posterior column pathway is going to be carrying information from sensation of fine touch, vibration, pressure, and proprioception up the posterior columns of the spinal cord. So the spinal tracts that are involved will include the left and right gracile fasciculus and the left and right cuneate fasciculus. After the second order neurons of the gracile and cuneate nuclei decussate, then those axons are going to enter in at the medial lemniscus, which is a tract. The posterior column pathway is going to be carrying information about sensations of fine touch, vibration, pressure, and proprioception. So this information is moving up through the posterior column of the spinal cord. So the second order neurons are going to synapse on the third order neurons in the ventral nuclei of the thalamus. Remember the second order neurons are those that are in the spinal cord and are interneurons. So the nuclei of the ventral nuclei of the thalamus 
are going to sort that arriving sensory information according to both the nature of the stimulus and the region of the body is involved. So therefore, it can be sorted and processed in the thalamus, and that will determine how we actually perceive the sensation when it's all said and done. So the localization, though, of the sensation is going to depend on where it comes in from and where it arrives in the primary somatosensory cortex. So here is a schematic of the posterior column pathway. So in this schematic, you can see, starting at the very bottom left of the image, you can see that that first order neuron, which is in red, brings sensory information into the spinal cord, and it ascends through the gracile fasciculus and cuneate fasciculus. And then it's going to synapse on the interneuron, which is the second order neuron, and then it's going to decuss or cross over onto the opposite side of the spinal cord and ascend. And it's going to ascend up through the midbrain and up into the ventral nuclei of the thalamus. And there it's going to synapse on the third order neuron, which will send information out to the primary somatosensory cortex. So you can see the sensory homunculus on the right demonstrating the functional map of the primary somatosensory cortex, showing you what parts of our body are mapped out on the cerebral cortex. Here we have the spinocerebellar pathway, showing you how proprioceptive information coming in from the Golgi tendon organs, the muscle spindles, as well as the joint capsule receptors will be sending that information up to the cerebellum. So you can see the first order neurons in red bringing information again in through the posterior root and the posterior horns, where it synapses in the spinal cord on the second order neuron, which then ascends up towards the cerebellum and that is where the information will be processed. So because the information in the spinocerebellar, me, spinocerebellar pathway is going to be processed in the cerebellum, this doesn't rise to the level of our awareness because it doesn't rise up to the level of our cerebrum. In the spinocerebellar tract, we have both an anterior and a posterior spinocerebellar tract. In the posterior spinocerebellar tract, we have axons that do not cross over to the opposite side of the spinal cord. So they travel up through the inferior cerebellar peduncle on the ipsilateral side of the stimulus. Whereas in the anterior spinocerebellar tract, we have sensations that are going to reach the cerebellar cortex through coming up through the superior cerebellar peduncle. And in this case, many of them, but not all, are going to cross over twice. So they'll decuss once in the spinal cord as you would normally expect, and then they may decuss a second time in the cerebellum. But this second crossing over, also called a double cross, is not really functionally significant in any way that we understand yet. Future research may explain this process further. So far we've discussed our somatic sensory pathways and now we'll discuss briefly our visceral sensory pathways. So when we refer to visceral sensory pathways we're talking about our viscera, so all of our organs in the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. So this sensory information is going to be collected by interoceptors as opposed to exteroceptors because they're monitoring information about our internal environment as opposed to our external environment. So the interoceptors are going to monitor visceral tissues and organs for things like changes in pain. So that includes nociceptors, baroreceptors will measure and respond to changes in pressure, thermoreceptors are specific to changes in temperature, we just reviewed all six types of the tactile receptors, which are also present in the visceral sensory pathways, and lastly, chemoreceptors as well. Now, while there are plenty of enteroceptors present in our thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities, we don't have nearly as many enteroceptors as we do as exteroceptors in our somatic tissues. The visceral sensory pathways are going to carry information on cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, and 10. So these cranial nerves will carry sensory information from the mouth, the palate, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the esophagus, and etc. So keep in mind that you can always use those mnemonics to remember what the cranial nerves are, so the O, O, O to touch and feel to figure out which cranial nerve it is we're talking about, and the some say merry money one will help you to figure out whether it's sensory motor or both. And keep in mind that when it's both, it's both sensory and motor. The solitary nucleus is actually not technically solitary because there are two of them. There is a large nucleus on each side of the medulla oblongata. So the solitary nucleus is a major processing and sorting center for visceral sensory information. So this is basically like your FedEx station for visceral information. 
there are plenty of extensive connections in between the solitary nucleus and the cardiovascular and respiratory centers, as well as also to the reticular formation. Pop quiz. Which nerve tract carries pain and temperature sensations to the cerebral cortex? A, the laterospinothalamic, B, the anterior spinothalamic, C, the dorsal column, or D, the spinocerebellar. So first, what are we carrying? We are carrying pain and temperature information, okay? And then where are we taking it to? To the cerebral cortex. So because we know it's going to the cerebral cortex, we can right away rule out the spinocerebellar, right? Because it's not going to the cerebellum, we know we're going to the cerebrum. So we know it's not D. The dorsal column is going to be carrying things like fine touch, vibration, pressure, and proprioception. So that's not going to be pain and temperature. So that brings us down to either the lateral or the anterior spinothalamic, because we know that once it synapses in the thalamus, that that information can then be sent out to the cerebral cortex for further processing. So we can differentiate between the anterior and lateral spinothalamic tracts. The anterior is going to be sending crude touch and pressure, and then the lateral spinothalamic tract is going to be sending pain and temperature information. So the answer is A, the lateral spinothalamic tract. What is the point of synapse for all second order to third order neurons except for olfactory neurons? A, the spinal cord, B, the nucleus gracilis, C, the nucleus cuneatus, or D, the thalamus. So very quickly, what do we have for the first, second, and third order neurons? First order is sensory, second order is going to be starting in the spinal cord and ascending, then the third order would be up going to the cerebrum, right? So if we start off thinking about it that way, we know that the first order neuron is going to synapse in the spinal cord on the second order interneuron. Right? So we can rule out A, we know that's incorrect. And then we have the nucleus and gracilla, sorry, the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus, which are present in the posterior column pathway. But in this case, what's happening is the first order neuron is again synapsing on the interneuron in the spinal cord. So we know it's not that. And so again, then we have to think, okay, well the thalamus, let's follow this through. If the first neuron, the first order neuron, is a sensory neuron, which synapses in the spinal cord and then ascends via that interneuron, which is the second order neuron, at that point, the synapse onto the third order neuron happens in the thalamus. So that is the point for all of the third order neuron synapsing to occur. And keep in mind, in the spinocerebellar pathway, it doesn't make it to the thalamus. There is no third order neuron in the spinocerebellar pathway there is only the first order neuron synapsing in the spinal cord, which then via an interneuron goes directly up to the cerebellum. Lastly, let's discuss section 15-5, the efferent division, and now we'll discuss the somatic motor pathways. Now we'll discuss the somatic nervous system, which is an efferent division, and that means efferent is motor, right? Sensory is afferent, motor is efferent, same. And this is made up of somatic motor pathways which control our skeletal muscles. So the CNS tracts in the somatic pathways are going to be named for the origination and then the termination point, or they're named for their location in general. So I've got a couple images here below that will show you the difference between the sensory tract locations versus the motor tract locations. We'll go into this in more detail in a second. So like I said before, the somatic nervous system is going to control contractions of our skeletal muscles, not of our viscera. This is just our somatic nervous system. And these pathways are going to involve at least two motor neurons, an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Just by the way, keep in mind when we're talking about the sensory pathways, we have the first order neuron, the second order neuron, and the third order neuron. But when we're discussing motor pathways, we have an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. The upper motor neuron is going to have a cell body that's going to be present in the central nervous system processing center, because this is where it starts. It will then synapse on the lower motor neuron, and the activity of this can work to either facilitate or inhibit the action of the lower motor neuron. So the lower motor neuron is closer to where the activity is going to be. So the cell body of the lower motor neuron is going to be in a nucleus of the brainstem or in the spinal cord, and then only the axon of the lower motor neuron is going to extend outside of the central nervous system. 
So this lower motor neuron will then innervate a single motor unit in the skeletal muscle, and the activation of which is going to trigger a contraction in that muscle which is innervated by that lower motor neuron. By the way, damage to this can eliminate both voluntary and reflexive control over the area that is innervated by this particular lower motor neuron. The somatic motor pathways will issue commands that are both conscious and subconscious motor commands. So they'll control our skeletal muscles traveling over three different integrated motor pathways, the corticospinal pathway, the medial pathway, and the lateral pathway. Figure 1510 in your text shows you a schematic of a cross-section of the spinal cord indicating the pathways for your descending motor tracts. So first let's look at the largest. Of the corticospinal pathways that are in lavender, you can see the largest is the anterior corticospinal tract, which is on both sides of the anterior median fissure. And then off to the side at the posterior lateral aspects, you can see in purple, the other large structures are the lateral corticospinal tracts. Remember, cortico cortex spinal, going to the spinal cord. We also have the lateral pathway, which is the rubrospinal tract, and rubro meaning red. You can see it's illustrated in red in this image. And we also have the medial pathway. So of the medial pathway, we have a few tracts. We have the medial and lateral reticulospinal tracts, the tectospinal tract, as well as the vestibulospinal tract, and these are all indicated up towards the most anterior aspect of this image. The corticospinal pathway is also known as the pyramidal system, and just by the way, it is pyramidal system, not pyramidal, although it is because it's beginning at pyramidal cells of the primary motor cortex. So the corticospinal pathway is going to provide voluntary control over our skeletal muscles. It does this as the pyramidal cells start off with axons descending into the brainstem and into the spinal cord which will then synapse on the lower motor neurons that are going to be responsible for controlling the skeletal muscles. There are three pairs of descending tracts of the corticospinal pathway. There are the cortical bulbar tracts, the lateral corticospinal tracts, and the anterior corticospinal tracts. The cortical bulbar tracts will provide conscious control over our skeletal muscles that specifically are going to move the eyes, the jaw, the face, and some of the muscles of our neck and pharynx. The cortical bulbar tracts are also responsible in part for innervating the motor centers of the medial and lateral pathways. In the corticospinal tracts, the axons are going to synapse on the lower motor neuron in the anterior horns of the spinal cord. This is visible along the anterior surface of the medulla oblongata, and you can see it as a pair of thick bands, which are called the pyramids. So the lateral corticospinal tracts will contain axons that are going to decussate or cross over at the pyramids, and the anterior corticospinal tracts are going to contain axons that cross over at a specifically targeted spinal segment in the anterior white commissure, which is the site of decussation. The motor homunculus is a little different from the sensor homunculus, but the idea is essentially the same. Both are functional maps showing you what the specific region of the body is that correlates with the innervation coming from or going to a specific part of our cerebral cortex. So this indicates that there's a degree of fine motor control available. So as you can see in this image, our hands are massive, right? Because we have a lot of motor control over our hands to do very fine detailed work. Whereas the trunk of our body is really small because there's really not a lot that we do with our trunk. We might bend or twist, but that's really about it. But our hands are very dexterous and can do a lot of things, hence our hands taking up a very large portion of the motor homunculus. And proportions of these are similar to those of the sensory homunculus, because just like you need to have lots of fine motor control to do things with your hands, you also have to have fine sensation on your hands to be able to have that same motor effect. In addition, there are centers that exist in the cerebrum, the diencephalon, and in the brainstem that can issue other motor commands that are somatic in response to subconscious processing. So these are things that don't rise to our conscious awareness. There is the medial pathway and the lateral pathway here. The medial pathway will send commands that help to control our gross movements of the trunk and our proximal limb muscles. So this is things like our biceps or muscles in our upper leg. We also have the lateral pathway, which is gonna help control the distal limb muscles. So this would be like in our wrist, for example, or in our ankle or our foot. 
and that helps us to perform very precise movements. So the medial pathway that we just talked about briefly, which is responsible for muscle tone and the gross movements of our neck, trunk, and proximal limb muscles, will have upper motor neurons that are located in three places, either the vestibular nuclei, the superior and inferior colliculi, or in the reticular formation. The medial pathway, however, will have upper motor neurons originating in the vestibular nuclei, which will receive information from the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve 8, regarding the position and movement of the head, which would be coming in through either which, the vestibular or the cochlear nerve, the vestibular nerve, right? Because the vestibule, vestibular nerve is going to be responsible for giving us information about our position and movement, whereas the cochlear nerve, hence cochlear implants, will give us information about hearing. So the primary goal of this medial pathway is to maintain our posture and balance, to keep us upright so we don't just fall over. And these descending fibers are going to form something called the vestibulospinal tracts. In the medial pathway, we have the upper motor neurons in the superior and inferior colliculi, and this will be located in the tectum, which is the roof of the midbrain. So the superior colliculi receives visual sensation, and the inferior colliculi receive auditory sensation. Remember, eyes over ears. So the eyes are the superior colliculi, and the ears are the inferior colliculi. The axons of these upper motor neurons will then descend in tectospinal tracts, decussate or cross over immediately, before they descend down to synapse on the lower motor neurons to create the effect. The medial pathway will have axons of the upper motor neurons in the reticular formation of the pons and in the medulla oblongata, and these are going to descend down into the medial and lateral reticulospinal tracts. So this is a loosely organized network of neurons that's going to extend throughout the brainstem. And so these tracts are going to descend down from the upper motor neuron to the lower motor neuron without decussing or crossing over to the opposite side. The lateral pathway will control our muscle tone and allow us to have precise movement of the distal parts of our limbs, like our wrists, our hands, our feet, our ankles, that sort of thing. So the axons of the upper motor neurons in the lateral pathway will originate in the red nuclei and then decussate in the brain and descend into the spinal cord in the rubrospinal tracts. So keep in mind the two things that are red go together here in the lateral pathway. The red nuclei and the rubrospinal tracts are both indicating red. Your textbook doesn't discuss the relationship between the basal nuclei and the cerebellum any more than two sentences, but the short of it is just that these are responsible for coordinating and also for integrating feedback control over our muscle contractions, and this can be either consciously or subconsciously directed. The basal nuclei in the cerebrum are going to provide the background information on patterns of movement in our voluntary motor activities. So these background patterns exist in things like when we're walking or running or whatever our rhythmic cycle is if we're riding a bicycle, things like this. So it gives us the background position of our trunk and limbs. So the basal nuclei don't exert control over our lower motor neurons, but instead what they do is they modify the activities of the upper motor neurons in the various different motor pathways, so that way it ends up changing the outcome a little bit. So it alters the instructions that are then carried by the corticospinal tract. Other axons will also alter the excitability or the inhibition of the reticulospinal tracts as well. Our cerebellum basically keeps us upright. So it's going to monitor incoming information about proprioception, so our position, also visual information coming in from our eyes, and balance information coming in from vestibular nerve from our internal ear. So the cerebellar activity is going to have patterns that are going to be developed by trial and error after many different repetitions over and over and over. So we can fine tune our complex movements that we want to execute with practice. So this is the idea behind practicing anything extensively to become very good at it, whether it's playing the violin or whether it's playing basketball or you know, having a really great golf drive. All of these things require fine tuning of these complex movements over and over. And through time, through these patterns in your cerebellar activity, they can be modified in slight ways to allow us to become successful at what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, another pop quiz. 
What would happen to you if the information from proprioceptors in your legs were blocked from reaching the central nervous system? Would you have A, no pain sensations from the legs, B, uncontrolled blood pressure in the legs, C, uncoordinated movements and the inability to walk normally, or D, no tactile sensations in the legs? Well, we can rule out A because remember we would think nociceptors are going to be the type of receptor that is specific for pain. So it's not A. And the uncontrolled blood pressure would be measured by baroceptors, right, or baroreceptors, which measure pressure. So that clearly wouldn't be applicable here. And then we went through all six different types of tactile receptors, and so we know it's not that. So proprioceptors giving us information about where we are physically to coordinate our space in place and time would absolutely impact our ability to be coordinated and to walk normally. So if our proprioceptors in our legs were blocked from reaching the CNS, we would have uncoordinated movements, we wouldn't be able to walk normally, and so the answer is C. Thank you so much everyone for your attention. That is the end of this week's lecture. Next week we're going to be studying the autonomic nervous system and higher order functions. I think you're really going to enjoy it next week. I hope you guys are staying healthy, I hope your loved ones are staying healthy, and I hope you're getting a little bit of time for rest for yourself too. So please take care of yourselves. You're doing a great job in this class and I couldn't be more impressed or more proud. As always, email me anytime if you have any questions whatsoever. Okay, see you soon.